By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. For he spake, and it was done. He commanded, and it stood fast. For by him were all things created, that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. If ye love me, keep my commandments. God is good. And all the time. Happy Sabbath, everyone. I do not believe the sun has actually set, but we must live by faith. We know it will set. So that's why I said, happy Sabbath. How was your day? How was your week? All right. The Lord brought you through day by day. If you're sitting where you are now, it means God in his mercy has brought you safely through. There are multiple thousands of people who began the week and are now lifeless. God has been merciful to us, and we must never take life for granted. As I was coming down the highway to this place, and the cars were flashing by, you've got to change this, take this exit, take that exit, go through the easy, whatever that thing is. You thank God there are angels on either side of you. Now, we're grateful they're driving tests and all of that. Fine, don't remove them. But let me tell you something. Particularly the children of God, we arrive safely by the grace of God ministered through angels. Mm -hmm. The devil is constantly trying to kill God's people. Angels protect us from a thousand different dangers. And so I really thank God for that. I have this practice, the spirit of God, I believe, put on me. It costs me money, but I can't get away from it. Every time I'm about to turn, turn to one lane or switch lanes, there's something called a blind spot. And I think I've seen everything. Just as I'm about to turn, there's a car sitting right there. And I say, Lord, thank you. And the spirit said, I want $30 for that. No, I'm not joking. The spirit says, I want $30 for that. And I have to give him. I was walking down the stairs in my house once and I almost tripped. It doesn't take much to break your ankle. The body is tough and also delicate. And the spirit said, how much would it cost for surgery to repair that ankle? I want $50. You're looking at me as though I need medication. But I'm being very serious with you. This has been put on me for the past year and a half by the spirit of God. And I said, Father, you're robbing me blind. But the, and today, today I was going somewhere to um, there's a Walmart close to where I'm staying. And I thought the road was clear. You see, when you drive in a strange city, you're really at a disadvantage. And I wasn't sure which road was going to I was about to go right across. There was a whole loss of traffic coming this way. And I stopped just in time. The spirit said, I want $100. I want $100. So I, uh, <laughs> you're looking at someone who tries to be as careful as possible so God doesn't take all my money. But he said, I, and I have to give it to him, he said, I want a hundred dollars. And what I do with the money, I send it to people whom I know overseas who are in great need. And I send it to them. But uh, I thank God for keeping me from all kinds of dangers despite how expensive it is getting. Our subject for this evening, councils on stewardship. What did I say? Does that title bring anything to mind? Yes, what is that? There's a book called Councils and Stewardship. All of you should have said yes. There's a book called, oh, read it by the way. Read that book, please. But before I get into that, let me ask you, of course, to preserve reverence wherever you are. I keep saying it, and I'll keep saying it. 
God's holiness does not change because we are on Zoom or Facebook or YouTube. So wherever you are, Facebook, YouTube, Zoom, uh, the different platforms, God is still holy. When Moses encountered him in the backside of the desert, God said, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. So remember, we're worshiping a holy God. He deserves reverence. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. The words that said, Let there be light. There was light. Those powerful, life-giving words, life-transforming words, those resurrecting words, I want them placed in my mouth. And favor number three, I want you to think. You are required to think. The Holy Spirit guides your thinking but does not think for you. God requires a tithe. He will not take it out of your salary the, God, the way the government takes its taxes. You know, God, we have to do our part. And we are required to think. Come now. Let us do what? Reason together, saith the Lord. Think, my beloved brothers and sisters. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we thank you. We can come to you and call you Father. We thank you for Christ who is brother and savior. We thank you for the convicting work of your spirit and also his work of guiding our minds into truth. We thank you, dear God, for the tireless work of protection of the angels who also assist us in the understanding of the word. As we bow in your presence, Father, if we've sinned, forgive us, dear God. Cleanse us, I pray, and grant us a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Truth. I commit this service to your glory, dear Father, and I ask you in the name of Jesus Christ, put your words in my mouth. Because the carnal nature loves to say things that sound intelligent and cute and scholarly, but Father, I desire to speak, thus saith the Lord. Put your words in my mouth, I pray, for your glory, God, and for the blessing of your people. I pray for those listening who may have COVID-19. Father, there's no disease you cannot cure. If you can raise the dead, you can remove a sickness. So please heal those persons just because you delight in mercy, according to Micah 7 verse 18. Heal them, dear God, whether they're believers or not, because you make your son to rise on the evil and on the good. Now, dear God, touch all those listening, particularly our visitors, Father. Bless them. Remember young boys and girls who are listening. Bless their little minds with a revelation of truth, dear God, because they understand much more than we suspect. Bless this country of the United States, God. This powerful country. Bless the leaders. Let them make decisions that are righteous. Because righteousness exalteth a nation and also the individual who practices it. Bless every nation represented by those listening, dear God. Save us when you come, Father. Until then, keep us faithful unto death. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. What's our subject? Councils on stewardship. Go with me to Acts chapter 7. We shall read from verse 47. The book of Acts chapter 7, reading from verse 47 is 7.30 on the dot. I'll release you somewhere between 8 and 8.15, if you find the verses quickly. Acts chapter 7, reading from first. This is a powerful sermon by that spirit-filled man called Stephen, and he lost his life for it, by the way. Preaching truth is a very dangerous thing to do, even in the church. Do you have the book of Acts? Do you have chapter 7, verse 47? Stephen says, Solomon built him a house. How be it? The Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, as saith the prophet. Heaven is my throne, and earth is my footstool. What house shall ye build me, saith the Lord, or what is the place of my rest? Hath not my hands made all these things? What is Christ saying? By the way, the creator is Jesus Christ. What is he saying? How can you build a house for God? Listen again to verse 49. Heaven is my throne. I sit on the entire heavens. The earth 
is my, you have those couches, this is a couch or a chair that reclines, and there's a part for your foot. Mm -hmm. God says, the earth functions that way for me. I just put my foot on the earth. The entire heaven is my couch. How can you build me a house? We must stop thinking we do favors for God. The only favor ever done is Calvary. By the way, when you help someone, you've done your duty. Only God can do a favor. Uh, you didn't hear what I said. Perhaps you're trying to analyze what I said. Only God can do a favor. We do our duty to our fellow man and fellow woman. And so God says, what house shall ye build me? God doesn't live in a physical building. God doesn't live in the pastor's office or the baptismal font. We cannot build a house for God. The entire universe cannot house God. Are you with me? All right. Having said that, let's run over to the book of Acts. We're still in Acts chapter 17. We'll read from verse 22. The book of Acts written by Luke. And I said previously, the central figure of Acts is the Holy Spirit. The book of Acts chapter 17, reading from verse 22. When you have that, say amen. amen. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God. Whom therefore ye ignorantly worship, him declare I unto you. Now verse 24, carefully, you can read with me if you like. God that made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hand. That's what we read in Acts 7, 47 to 50. Neither is worship with man's hands, as though he needed anything, see if he given to all life and breath and all things. Verse 25 says, we can't act as though God needs something from us. He gives to us, we need from God. God was alive before we were given life. And God will exist even after many people are destroyed. God doesn't need us to exist. God doesn't need us to survive. God himself is life. God himself is wealth. God himself is wisdom. God does not need us in order to be God. We need him. In order to live somebody say amen and recognize God what I am saying is not symbolic it is literal we've read from Acts 7 47 to 50 we've read Acts 17 22 to 25 let's go to Psalm Psalm 24 our subject councils on stewardship Seven thirty-five. Do you have Psalms 24? Read verse 1. I read, by the way, from the King James Version. If you have it, you may read with me. The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. Now, if the earth is the Lord's, we know Mars is the Lord's, Pluto is the Lord's, uh, Jupiter is the Lord's, Saturn is the Lord's, Betelgeuse is the Lord's, the sun is the Lord, because God made heaven and earth, the sea, all that in them is, all that in them is above. Everything belongs to God. That's why he named them. Psalm 147 verse 4, he calleth them all, he telleth the number of the stars, he calleth them all by their names. In the Bible, naming shows a special connection with the thing you named. He named all the stars because he made them. All the heavenly bodies because he made them. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I'm trying to establish the universal ownership of God. Let us go to Genesis 14. In this chapter, Lot has been captured by some armies from the other side of the Euphrates River. Abraham is informed in verse 13 of chapter 14 that his brother Lot was taken captive. Abraham arms 318 servants, goes after the armies, defeats them comprehensively because God was leading his, 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 his army, Abraham's army. Abraham comes back with all the goods, the booty, the loot, whatever, and brought back Lot, all the people, the women, the goods, everything he brings back. 
verse 14, verse 18 of Genesis 14. Let me pray again. Father, as I continue, be with me today, God, I pray, for your own sake, the sake of your glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, finish that verse for me, possessor of heaven and earth. Stop. Melchizedek, upon whom the priestly ministry of Christ is patterned, he called God the possessor of heaven and earth, all the heavens, all the earth. And verse 20 ends with this, that Abraham gave him tithes of all. We're introduced in the Bible for the first time to the concept of tithe, which is a recognition that everything belongs to God. There's a slightly twisted viewpoint among Christians that after I've given my tithe, the nine-tenth belong to me. That's not true. Haggai chapter 2 verse 8, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, said the Lord. When God put Job in his place in Job 38, he said, where was thou when I laid the foundation of the earth? Now when God laid the foundation of the earth, meaning he made the earth, here is what God also put in the earth. Go to Genesis 2. We read from verse 10. Our subject, counsels on stewardship. We look at money, we look at your body, we look at your time, we look at your ability. Counsels on stewardship. What is our relationship to God who possesses everything we have by right? Where did I tell you to go? Genesis chapter 2. We read from verse 10. And a river went out of Eden to water the garden, and from thence it was parted and became into two heads. The name of the first is Pison. That is it, which compasseth the whole land of Havilah. Read carefully now. Where there is gold. And the gold of that land is gold. <coughs> Sorry. There's Delium and the onyx stone. The Bible tells us clearly, <coughs> excuse me, when God made the earth, he made precious stones and he put them in the earth. Where there's gold. <laughs> Many economies are based on the gold standard. Am I right? We used to be based, but for some reason somebody changed it. But gold is a precious commodity. Fort Knox is protected more <laughs> powerfully than the White House. It is the most protected building on earth, Fort Knox. Not because it contains Bibles. It contains the gold reserve of the United States. I think an entire division or regiment of, 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 of soldiers defend Fort Knox. You can't dig down and get into it because it is so powerfully built, you just cannot get why. It contains gold, not the testimonies. Now listen again. That is it which composeth the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold. And the gold of that land is good. There's delium and the onyx stone. So the precious metals that today are regarded as indispensable to strong economies. I mean, countries like Namibia and Botswana and DRC that mine for diamonds and gold in South Africa. These things prop up economies. Why am I saying that? To say this, the nine-tenth belongs to God. We need to think that way. So proper stewardship of the, the wealth God has entrusted to us requires that we understand it all belongs to God. If you agree, say amen. amen. Mm -hmm. The tithe has a special classification. That's holy. Don't touch it. God told Adam and Eve, you see that tree? Leave it alone. And we're introduced to the concept of some things we're not to touch. There was nothing wrong with the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because the Bible says in verse 31, And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And the trees were made on day three. But it was not to be eaten. Stay away from it. Just stay away. This is mine. Every other tree is yours. So we have the concept of some things are set apart for God. And to, 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 to manhandle them, to tamper with them, is to place your life in danger. And in verse 14, chapter 14 of Genesis, we're introduced to the concept of tithe. Well, it's first mentioned. 
But we have to reason that Abraham got it from somewhere. Are you following me? Somebody told Abraham about tithe. And someone told the person who told Abraham. So tithe, while it's not mentioned expressly, must, by reasoning honestly, stretch all the way back. One-tenth of income belongs to God. But the Bible says, will a man, <clears throat> will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. Ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? In tithe, come on, and offering. Our expression to love does not end with the tithe. The tithe is stipulated, the offering is up to you. Are you with me? And I've heard some preachers say, and I find no reason to disagree, the tithe is really in the offering where you see love. Because it's up to you. Are you following me? You can give God a nickel, or you can give him whatever. You can give him a second tithe, a third. The tithe is where we really show love for God. God gives us no choice regarding, sorry, the offering is where we show love to God. We have no choice regarding the tithe as far as its amount is concerned. We have a choice to give it or keep it. But regarding the offering, that's up to us. By the way, let me digress briefly. How many days did God make? Seven. How many has he kept for himself? One. Now, does that mean he doesn't want any time from the other six? Uh, no one is listening. I'm talking to myself. Does he not want some time from the other six? Yes. Now our love for God may be seen more clearly in how much time we give him from the other six. We, we crowd everything on the Sabbath because we're not giving him time between Sunday and Friday. I am busy. You have one day. What else do you want? We forget that God made all seven. All seven belong to God. I realize you don't look very happy, but still stay. Amen. All seven days belong to God. He says the seventh is mine. There's no discussion. It's mine. But can I have some time on Tuesday? And why would God want that? Because it is God who keeps us alive on Tuesday. And Wednesday. And Friday. And Sunday. Let me stay on this road. Time is life. Who was the first person who came to this church tonight? First person who walked in. Who? Okay, let's say, okay. Who? What's the name? Tom, Dr. Tom, God bless you. Now, what time is it now? It's a uh, quarter to eight. Let's assume it's eight o'clock and Tom got here at six. He has spent two hours, am I right? Yes. But there's a different way to say it. He has lived two hours. Ah, uh, you, you didn't get it. He has lived from six to eight, am I right? He has lived two hours. Time is simply a word that measures life. It took me 45 minutes to come down the highway. I live for 45 minutes on that highway. Are you following me? I thank God for life. So when we think of the other six days, they all represent life. Whether the day is holy or the day is secular, it is life. And they all have 24 hours. So during the week, we know the Sabbath is God's. But let's show some love for God. Give him some time during the week. We know the tenth is his. Show some love with the offering. Because God can take all of it. He can take your job. How do you mean to come present God as a God who hijacks you? And, mm -mm. But he can take your job to save you from your selfishness. He can put you flat on your back in a bed. Just to save you from yourself. And so we thank God that he did not say give me all $100, just 10. Huh? We thank God he didn't say, I, I have seven, six days at Sabbath, you have one to work. He didn't do that. But look at the trees. God told Adam, avoid how many trees? One. All the rest were for him. Avoid one. Somebody say amen for God. God is a nice person. He gives us six days. And he wants one, he doesn't get it. Out of $100, he says, you have 90 to manage. Give me 10. He doesn't get it. He says, some things are not to be touched. They belong to me. We tamper with them. What's our subject? Councils on how do we manage finances? How do we manage 
our time? Do we give time for the work of the gospel? Some people live, use a clever argument, well, just live the right life. That's fine. That's fine. But how many evangelistic crusades result in baptism just because someone lived the right life? Are you following me? Jesus didn't just live the right life. He preached. He ministered this. The disciples went out. They ministered. They knocked on doors. They went from door to door. They did that. It's not just live the right life. There is a place for that. But if that's all we had to do, Christ would take millions of years to come. We must give time to God to witness to others of the goodness we have experienced from God. Let me pray again. Father, continue to be with me, I pray, please, in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Go to 1 Corinthians 3. It's almost 10 to 8. 1 Corinthians 3. We read from verse 16. First Corinthians 3, reading verse 16 and 17. Have you found it? Read with me. Know ye not that ye are what? The temple of God and that the Spirit of God does what? Dwelleth in you. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Now we're talking about this body. In Exodus 25, verse 8, no need to go there, you know it very well. Let them make me a sanctuary that I may what? Dwell among them. Now we are this, we are the sanctuary within which God desires to dwell in the person of his Holy Spirit. Know ye not that ye are the temple of the Holy Ghost? The temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. If any man do what? defile this temple him shall God destroy for your what for the temple of God is holy come on which temple ye are if any man defile this temple him shall God destroy in Revelation 11 8 in the Bible says when God comes he will destroy those who destroy the earth he will destroy those who destroy his temple I'm dealing us now with the management of our bodies, the physical. We touched briefly on the money. We touched briefly on time, and I'm coming back to time. We're looking at now this. Go to, go to chapter 6 of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 6. Let's read verse 15. I want you to read that for me nice and clearly. Are you there? As I said, we're talking about the body. What does it say? Know ye not that what? Your bodies are the members of Christ. Keep reading. Shall I then take the members of Christ, come on, and make them the members of an harlot? Now, why did Paul say that? There was a problem in the church of the men uh, patronizing prostitution. Paul is saying, I have to be delicate. Your body that you use for prostitution belongs to Christ. This hand belongs to Christ. I'm pausing. How can I say this? Your reproductive organs belong to Christ. And if we took that seriously, there are a lot of things we wouldn't do with them. That's what they were doing in, Cor in Corinth. And so Paul, don't you know that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of a harlot? Connect them with a prostitute? I can't do that. Why shouldn't? This body. Stay in that chapter. Go to verse 19. Now, verse 15 begins with, Know ye not? But look at how verse 19 begins. How does that begin? What? Stop. What does that sound like? <laughs> Shock. So, what? <laughs> Don't you know Adventists worship on Sabbath? What? <laughs> Don't you know water is wet? What? <laughs> so Paul says, what? Know ye not that what? Your body is the temple of the which is in you, 
which you have of God, come on, and ye are not your own. Stop. There's nothing symbolic about that. Listen to Genesis 2.7. Don't go there. Just listen. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. Breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Man became a living soul. At death, where does the body go? Well, who made the dust? God. Where does the breath go? Where did the breath originate from? God. Everything is from God. This really belongs. This is a literal statement. God has two certificates of ownership. Creation and salvation. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not. If I, we take better care of the things that belong to others. If I borrowed your car, I'll be ten times more careful with it than I am with my own car. If I'm speaking the truth, come on, say amen. Yes. I can wreck my car, so okay, okay. But I can't wreck yours. This belongs to God. It has been entrusted to us for the glory of God. And to emphasize this fact, Paul writes, whether therefore ye eat, that's physical, come on, or drink, that's physical, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. What kind of dresses do you put on, outfits, male or female, on this? I can't decorate this like a maypole. You don't know what a maypole is, okay, like a flag, you know, okay. This belongs to God. If you loan me your car, your car is gray, nice, respectful, conservative gray. Then I point it, paint it polka dot and striped. What am I, how am I dressing this body? What do I put on the inside? Why am I flooding my inside with alcohol and with cherry coke? Now, I'm not trying to be, <laughs> what's the word there? <laughs> Pharisaical. Why am I smoking? Damaging the lungs that do not belong to me. From a biblical perspective, they literally do not belong to me. Because I never made them. You see, ownership in the Bible is based on creation. If you can show you created yourself, then you belong to you. And so as we continue with councils on stewardship, this body, what do we eat? And how much? <laughs> what do we drink? And how much? Who determines how we eat? Is it culture or the Bible? And since we're Adventists, plus the light from God's servant to this church, Amen. whom we just universally ignore. My brothers and sisters, the councils on the stewardship I'm talking about is the stewardship of our physical bodies, the stewardship of our income, the stewardship of our time. The stewardship of our talents. If you look at uh, the great black singers, they all started in church. <laughs> well, if you, well I, I'm going to show my age. Well, you have Marvin Gaye or Diana Ross or uh, she died recently. Um, well, you've been in Houston and the other. Aretha Franklin, these great singers. You know, and those from even way back, they all began in church. Then the world pulled them out. You have a gift. You must manage that gift realizing the gift was given by God for his glory. I've often said special music is not an audition. Neither is preaching. Preaching is not an auditory CV. Singing is not an audition for the Grammys. Singing is an act of worship for God. We must use our talents for the glory of God. All that God has given to us is for his glory. Go to 1 Chronicles 29 quickly. Let's read from verse 11. 1 Chronicles 29, reading from verse 11. The time is 5 to 8. Our subject counsels on stewardship. Let me pray while you. Father, as I continue, please God, restrain me, constrain me. Direct me, speak through me, Father. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You have First Chronicles 29. We read from verse 11. Councils on stewardship is our subject. When you found it, say amen. 
Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Now, whatever victory is, whatever majesty, you know, victorious armies are allowed to be victorious by God. Uh, vic every victorious army is allowed to be victorious by God. When Nebuchadnezzar overthrew Jerusalem, Daniel 1 verses 1 and 2 tell us God gave Jerusalem to him. There is no victory in which God is not somehow connected. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. Read with me. For all that is in the heaven and in the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art and exalted as head above all. Read verse 12 carefully. Both riches and honor come of thee. Stop. Riches do not originate with uh, Gates or Jeff Bezos. What's the fellow? The other fellow has a lot of money. Don't remember well, Warren. Mm -hmm. Both riches and honor come of thee. And thou reignest over all. And in thy hand is power and might. Every ruler on earth must realize that power originates with God. Romans 13 verse 1, let every soul be subject to the higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Power originated with God. Now it's always misused. Power, the concept of power originated with God. And in thy hand is power and might. And in thine hand it is to make great and to give strength unto all. Now, power Greatness, might, honor, victory, majesty, you name it, they all come from God. Do you occupy a high position in your company? That's by God's doing. Don't run around with your chest in the air. Mm -mm. Because God can flatten that chest. You ask Nebuchadnezzar. When he puffed up his, is this not great Babylon that I have built? God said, oh no, 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 no. Let me show you who built it. He put him down for seven long years. The Bible says when he lifted up his eyes and acknowledged God, God restored his mind and his kingdom because God is a good God. He isn't vicious. He holds no grudges. He desires to save. And finally, God was able to save Nebuchadnezzar. Power comes from God. Honor. Are you widely respected? That is a gift from God to be used to exert a saving influence on people. It is not to build people and do whatever else people do who are in powers of position. Look at verse 14. What does that say? But who am I? Are you not there yet? You lost, you lost it? First, First Chronicles 29 verse 14. First Chronicles 29 verse 14. Are you there now? Read with me. But who am I? And what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this kind? Keep reading. For all things come of thee. Finish it. And of thine own have we given thee. The only thing you and I can legally claim as our own is sin. God owns that house where you live. God owns that car. That bank account. That house by the lake. <clears throat> that cabin in the woods. That motor home. God's. Because all the material required to make a motorhome, God put in the earth. Those clothes you're wearing, God. Because you did not invent cotton. Are you following me? <coughs> you didn't. The shoes you're wearing, God's. Because you did not create cows. Are you following me? To provide leather. Everything. Now this is a mindset we must live by. With that mindset, it's easy to give. I'll wait all night for one person to say amen, forgive. <laughs> God loves you nonetheless. He loves you more than he loves me, perhaps. Counsels on stewardship. Let me get back to life. The earth is the Lord's 
and the fullness thereof the world and they that dwell therein we read in first corinthians 6 19 what know ye not that your body is the temple of the holy ghost which is in you which ye have of god and ye are not your own for ye are bought with a price name the price the blood of christ now give what christ paid for to him you have not yet made a decision to be baptized acknowledge that your life belongs to god and he wants it that's not different from the way we think you, you if you go online and order something from amazon you expect it to delivered by drone in three days or two are you with me and if you don't get it you call i paid where's my product if it's late five minutes you track it online it's down the street it's cost it's come around the corner it's on the sidewalk you track it because you're paid you go to a restaurant you sit down you give your order hey, where's the food it's only five minutes where's the food god said i paid for you where's your life give it to me this is no joke give it to me because it is mine and god has a legal document that's the document of salvation which only has meaning in the blood of jesus christ and his resurrection god has bought your life and the receipt is signed in blood and he wants your life give it to him Amen. we're not speaking from revelation i have not used one text from revelation i'm speaking literally your life belongs to god give it to him in surrender let him direct you anything in the hands of god is well preserved well managed and well protected are you listening to me anything in the hand of god it is well preserved well managed well protected and that management that preservation that protection extends into the life to come you may think you manage your life but that management will end when christ comes since a christian is an intelligent person we think of the long haul what did Jesus say? What is a man profited? If he gains what? The whole world and loses his soul. This is the whole world. This is the soul. So tonight I ask you under the heading of counsels on stewardship. Give your life to God. It rightfully belongs to him. Give, commit. Let me tell you what happened to me. It actually happened. It's a... Uh, Three after eight, I said I'll let you go by eight and eight fifteen. Many years ago, I had a little car, Honda CRX. They don't make them anymore. Cute little thing, two seats. I bought it so only my wife and I can get into it. <laughs> the Lord forgave me for selfishness. Can give anyone a ride? Just my wife and I would drive this thing. Ah, but we grow in grace. Somebody say amen, and we put off our folly. And I was conducting a Bible study at my local church, and I talked about the fact that everything belongs to God. And the members, we discussed it, yes, the, your house, your car. A couple of weeks later, I was sitting in my car in the driving parking lot. And the spirit, and I said to God, Father, I am teaching this lesson. I need to apply it. I commit this car to you. It's yours. I'll change the oil, put in the gas, drive it, whatever. But it's your car. I am your chauffeur. Two things happened to me. A couple of weeks later, I was going somewhere. Now, I was known in my church for flying low when I drove. You don't know what flying low is. We have somebody sitting next to you. I would fly low. Once I was on a highway going back to college, I was doing 125. And the truckers were talking about me on the CB road. That's how far back it was. They were discussing me on, yes, on, did you see that car? And I'm alive today because God is merciful. And there were five of us in that car. One little wiggle and we've been dead. I was getting ready to drive my little CRX and the Spirit of God said to me, this is my car now. You cannot drive it like that. What did I say? Speak to me. Who did I say? The Spirit. I heard the voice. This is my car now you cannot now why did he speak to me i recognized his ownership what's the second thing that happened i had measured the mileage on my little car 36 per hour that's very good not per hour on a highway per gallon excellent mileage two weeks later i measured it after i committed the car to god it was giving me 46 miles to the gallon 
I'm not saying he do that for you. God blesses us in different ways. I'm simply saying when I acknowledge God, he delivered me from speeding. And I didn't ask him. He increased the mileage of my little limousine by 10 miles per gallon. And God is listening to me. He knows I'm not lying. Both, I, up to this day, I say to God, Father, remember you took speeding from me. And I didn't ask, why don't you take this thing as well? I keep asking, I still have it. Why don't you take that as well? I remind him all the time of when he took speeding from me from the day the Spirit said, this is my car now, you cannot drive it that way. All love for speeding left at that, from that very point on. Up to this day, I love to keep the speed limit. And he increased the mileage by 10 miles per gallon. What is God willing to do for you if you acknowledge his rightful ownership of your life? His rightful ownership of your so-called possessions. Commit yourself to God. With you comes everything. You see, when God gave Christ, he gave everything. Thank you, thank you, thank you. He gave everything. Because God gave the creator of heaven and earth. And you heard me read earlier, all things were created by him and for him. Jesus says, all thine are mine. In uh, John 17 verse 10. In John 16 verse 15, all things that the father hath are mine. When God gave Christ, he gave everything. Otherwise said he had nothing left. Now when you give yourself to God, bring everything with you. Give him your job your health, your romantic relationship, your education, and make sure everything is for his glory. Amen. Counsels on stewardship. When God made Adam and Eve, he said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion, not ownership. With ownership, there would have been no need to report to God. Are you with me? With dominion, which is management, they had to report to God. That's why the Bible says in Job 1 verse 6, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. From various worlds, representatives came to God. And this happened regularly. Satan would come to represent the earth. That ceased when Jesus died and rose. Because then Christ became the legal representative of this earth. That's why Jesus said, now is the prince of this world cast out. He could no longer go back to heaven. Give your life to God. You will never regret it. My mother suffered from asthma. All I could remember all her life. After she got baptized, the asthma virtually disappeared miraculously. Mm -hmm. Now, God blesses people differently. Don't, miss it. Don't think because you get wet. you. <laughs> but it disappeared or was reduced to the point where it ceased to be a problem. Because I could remember sometimes as a little child, I would hear my mother wheezing in the bedroom, struggling for breath. She gave her life to God. When she accepted the truth of the Sabbath, God baptized, and the Lord gave her relief from that thing in a miraculous way. All I'm saying is, when we acknowledge God as the rightful owner of us to totally, God rewards us with blessings, but he decides what the blessing will be. And so tonight, I call upon you, wherever you are online, at uh, Born Again or FMC, give your life to Christ. If the Spirit of God has been moving you to get baptized, make that decision. The Spirit may have been nudging you to be rebaptized because the life you've lived, you see, in the walk with God, or the Christian life, let me say that, there's no such thing as flat lining in the Christian life. You're either going this way, finish my words, or that way. There's no flat lining. You're either growing or you're deteriorating. Now, it is slow. So slow it becomes imperceptible. But it happens nonetheless. So 15 years later, you look back and you realize, I no longer have an interest in the study of the Bible. When did that happen? There's no specific date. It happens gradually. The growth happens gradually. You look back, you realize, you know, there was a time when you said that I'd knock you flat on your back. What happened to me? You changed. Christ wants your life. For one major reason, it's his. But more than that, 
He wants it because he wants you connected, united with him. And that's literal at a spiritual level. He wants a oneness with us that is impossible without a total surrender to him. And so he says, thou shalt love the Lord thy God, how? With all thine heart and with all thy soul, with all thy might, with all thy strength. Total surrender. For those of you listening, wherever you are, make that decision to give your life to Christ. Make the decision for baptism if you have been convicted that way. And there's someone listening who would require some, who requires a little more study. Contact the church. Let someone know. And that church will make arrangements for you to receive the extra study you need to bring you to the point of that intelligent decision to get baptized and be connected with Jesus Christ. Because those who are baptized have put on Christ. For tonight, I want you to make four decisions. Other one, return God's tithe to him. Malachi 3 verse 9, ye are cursed with a curse, even those, this whole nation. For he have robbed me, sorry, even this whole nation. There is a curse. Two, make a commitment to give your body physically to Christ. Watch what you eat, what you drink, how you dress it. Don't dress it so it looks like an idol. You see, the ancient heathens, they were trying to look like the idols they dressed. Are you following me? So they can identify with their idols. They put things all over their idols' gold and then they put it on themselves so they look like the idols. When God told Moses to make garments for Aaron, he told him in Exodus 28 verse 2, and thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother for glory and for beauty. In that order. For glory and for beauty. The designers operate on beauty and that's it. So we have to have Johnny O. Johnny Hilfinger, whatever his name is, we have to have uh, uh, somebody else from Paris, someone else from London. So it, we want the brand name, so they give us class and a sense of purpose in life. We are to dress first for glory. And whatever glorifies God is beautiful. Are you following me? Because we think with the mind of heaven, not the mind of the earth. I want you to give your time to God. Yes, there's one holy day, but the other six belong to him, and he wants some of that time. I want you to give your talents to God. Can you play? Can you sing? Can you write? Can you counsel? Can you listen and not feel overwhelmed? Give it to God for the glory of his name and for the blessing of the church family and beyond. Time, talent, treasure, temple how many will say father by the grace of god i surrender all four to you can i see your right hand mean it with all your heart stand up with me please and for those who are making the decision for baptism which is tomorrow please contact the pastor or someone at your church who will get to the pastor make that decision i i insist with brotherly love make that decision it's a life and death decision let's pray father in heaven we thank you for your word we thank you, Lord, the Bible tells us how to exercise stewardship. We thank you, God, for the Christ-like humility that comes with stewardship, recognizing that my life, my talents, my temple, my treasure rightfully belong to you. Dear God in heaven, forgive us for the arrogance of thinking we own everything, Father. Forgive us, dear God. We live and we learn. From this time forward, Father, we want to live and function with the consciousness that we are absolutely indebted to you. Father in heaven, grant us an extra measure of your spirit. And for that man, that woman struggling with the concept of tithe, if I return a tithe, how will I manage this or that? Let that person understand, dear God, that you will take care of him or her. And the same goes for all other areas of stewardship. In the name of Jesus, Father, give us a love for you that supersedes all other concerns in this life. Let the words we've heard tonight remain on our hearts. Bring us back tomorrow, day, God, to worship you again. In Jesus' name we pray. Let God's people say, Amen and Amen.